1 Timothy chapter 6 for our consideration uh, this evening. 1 Timothy and chapter 6. We're coming to the uh, the end of uh, 1 Timothy. We've looked at a chapter a week. We considered in chapter 1 the uh, dealing with false teachers in chapter 2, the worship of the church in chapter 3, its officers in chapter 4, its minister. And then last week we looked at how the church uh, deals with each other and the various relationships within the church. And now this evening we are going to look at what I'm calling the church in the world. The church in the world. And we're looking at this sixth chapter in that context. We're going to see a a number of different responsibilities. We're going to consider uh, from servants right up to the the rich and how we deal uh, with each other and also uh, with the people in the world. Uh, We are looking at the church in the world. We confess there's too much of the world in the church, but that is not the subject for this evening. The subject this evening is the church and its dealings uh, in the context of living in a world that does not believe in the God that we believe in, and yet we are to not only believe in our God uh, in the context of our relationship uh, in the church, but especially tonight in the context of our relationship uh, to society and the world at large. First of all, we want to consider uh, the responsibility of servants, believers who find themselves in the context of being servants. And we see that in verses 1 and 2. And we see the responsibility stated in verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy, note this, not just of honor, but of all honor. There is to be due honor given to those that we work for, to those that we serve. It's not to be eye service, it's not to be what man sees, but it is with respect to what God sees in us. All honor is to be given. This is one of the things that the world does not do, and this is where the church has an opportunity to shine as lights in the world, to be distinct and to be different in our dealings in and with the world, to show our faith by our actions, to use the uh, idea of James. That's the responsibility stated. And then the reason, a very important reason, is that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed God was blasphemed literally because of the Jews as Paul reminds us in another place this is not to be the case respecting the church we are to so serve in this world that we are not to be the cause of others blaspheming God they will blaspheme God but they're not to use us as an excuse. And then thirdly, we have a special requirement. And they that have believing masters, in other words, now it's just not the general idea of serving a master in general, but now one who is a believer. It says, let them not despise them because they are brethren. In other words, familiarity is not to breed contempt but rather more honor is to be given to the people of God in this context but rather do them service because they are faithful there's the the added idea here yes serve them as you would uh, any master but even more so because they are numbered among the faithful and the beloved partakers of the benefit or the blessing, the blessing of being Christians. And we are to treat believers in, in, a, in a, a special way. The scripture tells us to do good to all men, but especially 
to the household of God. We are to treat believers with the highest honour. And the world is to see that. The world is to recognise that we treat one another with this honour. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, By this men shall know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have one to another. So we're not to allow this familiarity, this the fact that we are brethren, to be a negative effect, but actually to encourage greater obedience to the Lord in these things. And then at the end of verse 2 and throughout verse 5, we see Paul going back to the responsibility um, of the minister, Timothy, uh, in particular in the context, but to all ministers as a consequence. It says at the end of verse 2, These things teach and exhort. Notice, it's not just to give the facts. Don't just give the details, but exhort. In other words, that you the people are to do what you're saying. There's a responsibility on the minister to teach and to exhort, but that implies that the congregation are to do what the minister exhorts once it's in context of the scriptures, of course. And then we see regarding his relationship to false teachers in verses 3 to 5, going back to the subject of chapter 1, we see this in verses 3 to 5. And the first thing we notice is how we identify the false teacher. How do we recognize a false teacher? Well, verse 3 says it. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words. In other words, once uh, someone teaches anything else than what the word of God says and does not consent to the word of God, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to to godliness. This is the litmus test, isn't it? This is the the test that everyone must pass. And we can have different views on certain things, but when it comes to the gospel, there must be conformity. There must be agreement. There must be submission to the words of Christ. Otherwise, You're a false teacher. Otherwise, you are rejected by the word of God. That's identifying the false teacher. And then the character and emptiness of the false teacher in verse 4. If he doesn't do these things, in other words, if he does reject Christ and his words and the gospel and teaching other things, it says he is proud knowing nothing. In fact, the scripture tells us, doesn't it, that in order to be acceptable to God, we must be humbled and we must submit to the words of Christ. Otherwise, we are still in our sin. And if this is what this, uh, whoever he is, whoever she is in these days, then they are proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words and we see this in so many contexts in our day thirdly the danger of false teachers we're not talking about something that's irrelevant we're not talking about just having a different view on uh, what the weather is going to be today or whatever it is no the danger is in verse 4 again whereof cometh envy strife railings Evil surmisings, when people stand outside the word of God and start to come up with their own ideas uh, about things, the result is envy, strife, railings, arguments, evil surmisings, people filled with their own thoughts, perverse disputings of men, verse 5, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. These are not minor issues. And indeed, the universal church of Jesus Christ is filled with such men and women, not only in the pew, but also in the pulpit. The danger of false teachers. 
And Paul reminds Timothy of such. Specifically, he says at the end of verse 5, supposing that gain is godliness. This could be so easily speaking of the, the word faith movement, the name it and claim it movement. So Paul uh, Pilser wrote a book called God Wants You to Be Rich. And Time magazine in 2006 had on the front page of its magazine, Does God Want You to Be Rich? And a picture of a Rolls Royce with, instead of the Rolls Royce symbol on the front, uh, a symbol of the cross at the front of the vehicle. Does God want us to be rich? And these false teachers come to this conclusion that gain is godliness. Yes, God wants us to have these things, whether it be a Rolls Royce or a mansion or the best job in town, whatever it is. So what is the required response of the minister and to the people of God to such individuals? Simply, it says at the end of verse 5, from such withdraw thyself. From such have nothing to do with them. Separate yourself from these people. You have no business even spending the time of day. Don't receive them as John tells us in one of his epistles. Don't receive them into your home, but separate yourself from them because their teaching is dangerous. I remember talking to a, a professing believer many years ago who I assume was a believer and professes to be a Christian who said that Benny Hinn was a godly man. Benny Hinn is not a godly man. Let me say this very clearly. Benny Hinn is a disciple of the devil. Benny Hinn and anyone like him is a disciple of the devil and doing the devil's work and is filled with the spirit of Beelzebub, I will go that far, filled with the spirit of Antichrist and he is to be rejected and everyone like him. We are to withdraw ourselves from such and to name them as the enemies of Christ, as the enemies of the gospel, as the enemies of all truth. The Lord Jesus Christ said of himself that the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He was not rich by this world's standards. He was poor. Speaking to the rich young ruler, he said, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor. This doctrine that God wants you to be rich is from the pits of hell, and it is not according to the gospel. Thirdly, the Christian's relationship to finance verses 6 to 10. First of all, we recognize what real gain is. What real gain is. But godliness with contentment is real gain. Now there's gain. That's the riches of the gospel. To have victory over sin. To love the word of God. To live a quiet and peaceable life in obedience to Christ, this is great gain. Not amounting to myself as much finance as I can because supposedly God wants me to be rich, but no, living in the victory of the gospel, that is gain. Thomas Watson's book, The Great Gain of Godliness in this context, is well worth reading. Secondly, not only recognizing real gain, but recognizing reality. This is axiomatic, isn't it, in verse 7? For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. This is self-evident. We, even the unbeliever, recognizes this. So the Egyptians who buried their kings in the... Uh, pyramids with lots of riches uh, with them, an exercise in folly. 
Why? Because they stayed there till thieves came along and stole the riches out of the tombs. Because we can't take it with us when we die, as the proverb says. And then realizing the secret of contentment. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. The Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, there's Christians today who buy lotto tickets. Let me say this clearly. It's sinful. It's sinful to buy lotto tickets because it's looking for that which God has not decided you should have. And it is against the word of God because Christ tells us to pray, not give me this day the the, the lotto millions, but give me this day my daily bread. It's a sin to buy tickets from the National Lottery, of which Christians must repent. Fourthly, recognizing the danger of passing riches, verses 9 and 10. Again, just as there's danger with false teachers, there's the danger of passing riches. In verse 9 it says, now notice, but they that will be rich, not those that are rich, but they that want to be rich. In other words, their heart, there are believers that are rich, but their heart is not in their riches. That's the difference. It's the heart's attitude towards riches. If God has blessed you with lots of money and you're using it for the glory of God, that is wonderful. But if your heart is after riches, for riches' sake, there is great danger. It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. This is absolute. This is not might. It says, they that will be rich will fall into temptation and a snare. Just by wanting to be rich. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the believer it is give us this day our daily bread that's the prayer just to have a roof over your head to have a bed to lie in at night to have dinner on the table and to live a life of godliness with contentment that is great gain because brethren we're just passing through this world. It goes on in verse 10 to define. It says, The love of money is the root of all evil. To love riches, to love advancement in this world, all of these things are at the very root of uh, moral evil. That was the, the sin in the Garden of Eden. That's what the devil sold Adam and Eve. You will be like God. You will have things that at this moment God is holding back from you. That is the root of that sin. A desire for more. A desire to have something that God is not giving you by his providential care. Something that you perceive that God is holding back from you and something that as verse 10 goes on to say that you covet after which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith so we see here that to covet that which does not belong to you will cause you to go astray from the faith why because the faith of the gospel is about submitting to god's will for your life if I do not so if I'm restless, if I'm restless regarding my present state, if I'm not content, I am erring from the faith. I'm not dealing with the, the very basics of what it is to be a Christian, which is to live submitting to the providence of God in my life. The consequence, as verse 10 goes on to say, is and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. 
This is true even for the unbeliever. If there's a, a going after things that uh, is, is not yours by uh, the providence of God, it, it results in, in this discontent. So somebody that thinks, if I could just have so much money, if I could just have so much uh, advancement in this area or that area, and, and they think that that will give them happiness... The inevitable consequence is, even if they get it, to be filled rather with sorrow. There was a program many years ago done on six people that won the the pools, an old uh, equivalent to the National Lottery in, in England many years ago. And it showed how winning the pools didn't really bless the people's lives. Most of them actually had done damage to them. So this is a principle not just for the believer. This is a principle for uh, for everybody. If there's a running after something that you think, well, this will make me happy. And even if you get it, quite often it will result in sorrow. So that could be an extramarital affair. If I could just have this other woman, this other man, I would be happier. And you get this other woman, other man, and you realize, actually, it has not fulfilled me. It's made my situation worse. Recognizing the danger of these things. But then, fifthly, on this second heading, or this third heading, I should say, recognizing the better way in verses 11 to 12. Notice the three F's here. There's flee, there's follow, and there's fight. But thou, O man of God, verse 11, flee these things, just like Joseph fleed the attempted embrace of that sinful woman, just as as Potiphar's wife sought to draw him into her bed. He fleed, he left behind his coat, and he fleed out of her presence. We, as men and women of God, we are to flee from even the temptation of these things. That's the fleeing. And then notice the following. Follow after righteousness. Godliness There's an idea of pursuing. Instead of pursuing sin and things that are harmful for us, we are to follow after, we are to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And brothers and sisters, if we pursue these things, we will find blessing. We will find riches for our soul. We will find great contentment and great fulfillment. The problem is, so often, we are not following after these things. We are not doggedly pursuing righteousness, just like the Lord Jesus Christ, thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, had anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Do you see the point? When we're like the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be anointed with the oil of gladness. We will be made the joyful men and women that God has desired that we should be. Isaiah 26, verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Follow after these things. Pursue them. Make them the goal. It's the Philippians 3 principle. The pursuing constantly, Paul, constantly pursuing these things, never satisfied with thinking, well, I've enough of Jesus. I have enough of God. I have have enough of the gospel. No, I want more of Christ. I want more of godliness. I want more of him, more sanctification. Increase our faith, more love, more patience, more meekness. Brothers and sisters, if the church had more people like this who were desiring these things, even as much as the ungodly desire 
They're ungodly things. Imagine if we wanted righteousness and meekness and godliness and faith, love and so on. If we wanted these things even as much as the ungodly wanted to win the national lottery. How much better the church would be. How much stronger we would be. If we had even that level of desire. So flee the things, up to verse 10, follow after righteousness, and so on, and now fight. Fleeing, following, and now fighting. It is a fight, but it's a good fight. There's many fights that are bad. And people tend to fight for their own desires, their own sinful desires. All you have to do is declare that a certain supermarket is going to be selling everything at half price or something like that. And you will see people literally pushing each other out of the way. We've seen on the TV or on the computer screen in recent uh, in recent times where in America on a certain day, I think it's called Black Friday, isn't it? And they're literally pushing each other and shoving each other out of the way to get these things but that's a bad fight this is a good fight fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life why because we have been called to it look what it says fight the fight of faith lay hold because whereunto thou art called The call of God is the constant encouragement to this pursuing, to this fighting, the good fight of faith. Paul could say in 2 Timothy 4, I have fought a good fight. Let us live our lives in a way that we will be able to say at the end, I fought that good fight. I did lay hold on eternal life. Yes, I sinned. Yes, I failed. Yes, I'm a a desperate sinner. But by the grace of God, I was enabled to lay hold on eternal life. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. In other words, Timothy, don't make thyself out to be a liar. Continue with that profession how many profess faith in Christ and eventually walk away how many profess faith in Christ and after a period of time forsake him no profess him and then keep pursuing him fourthly the context and the reason of all of this in verses 13 to 16 one God is watching us God is watching us. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. God is looking. Every moment, every day, God is looking at you. Timothy, therefore live in the light of God's seeing. Secondly, Christ has exemplified for us how we should live. Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Stand before the judges of this world like Christ. Stand before Pilate and say that my kingdom is not of this world. I don't belong to this earth. I am a a stranger, an alien, a pilgrim. I'm passing through. We're going and we belong to a different place. Thirdly, God has commanded us. This is not optional. Thou keep this commandment without spot. It's a command. It's not an optional extra in the Christian life. And do it without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. What are we to do? We are to flee ungodliness. We are to follow righteousness 
And we are to fight the good fight of faith and to keep doing it. To keep on keeping on. To keep on pursuing Christ. So that nothing else matters. That I'm willing to sell all for the one pearl of great price. The Lord Jesus said that if I'm not willing to forsake all for him, I am not worthy of him. If the righteous be scarcely saved. Brothers and sisters, this is not easy. In fact, this is impossible. With man, this is impossible. This is why we must have the grace of God. The grace of God that not only begins us on uh, the, the highway that we considered this morning, the highway of holiness, the motorway that leads us to heaven, but this grace of God must continue with us and every day and every moment keep us and keep keeping us in that way. Fourthly, everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. We live in the sight of a God, as we said this morning, the only one who is sovereign. The only one who is in control. And here we have it again. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords who only hath immortality. The only one that possesses life in himself. The only one who can for sure say, I will never die, is our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we will never die, because we live in him. He is the one who dwells in the light which no man can approach unto. Who no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. And that becomes the guiding principle, brethren. The guiding principle for all of us is that Christ gets the honor. That Christ is worshipped. That Christ is glorified. And that's why I will not succumb to ungodliness. I will not live my life in a life of sin. That I will flee ungodliness. That I will follow righteousness. And that I will continue fighting the fight of faith for the honor of Christ. For the honor of of Christ that is my life that is my profession that is my desire that is my end fifthly in verses 17 to 19 specific exhortations to the ones with temporary riches very briefly remind them it is temporary charge them that are rich in this world it's only in this world The rich man in Luke 16, he was rich in the world and yet he went to hell. Secondly, remind them not to be aloof, not to be high-minded, not to think that they are better than everyone else. Not to be thinking, well, we're the aristocracy, we're the the great people of the world. No, don't be high-minded. Thirdly, Know where their trust should and should not be. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Never trust in what you have, for it can come and go in a moment. Easy come and easy go. Why? Because God is the one who gives us all things to enjoy. And the principle of thankfulness is also included in the text. Be thankful. I remember one time many years ago, we were in a family home and we wanted to give thanks for the food and there was great offence taken at this. And But we have to give thanks to God. We have to thank God because he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. Always give thanks. It's one of the greatest testimonies and principles that we can live our life by is to give thanks to the Lord. Fifthly, remind them what they are to do. They are to do good. That is the rich, verse 18. They're to do good. They that they're to be rich in good works, ready to distribute 
willing to communicate. So four points here. Generally, they're to do good. Specifically, they're to be rich in good works. In, in preparation, they are to be ready to distribute and in willingness to communicate. Sixthly, why and with what knowledge are they to do this? Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Their riches will not get them to heaven, but their attitude in their life towards Christ and what they do with their riches by the grace and mercy of God will. And then lastly, closing exhortations to Timothy in verses 20 to 21. I love this phrase, O Timothy. Paul is not writing as some theologian in an ivory tower. He's speaking as a father of souls. Timothy is his son in the faith. And he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Just keep it, Timothy. Just don't let it go. Avoid profane and vain babblings. Don't get caught up in the nonsense of the day and people's weird ideas. Avoid them. Just walk away from them. And oppositions of science falsely so-called. A lot of people have their ideas. Just avoid them. Just commit yourself, Timothy, to preaching the word. To thy trust. To thy ministry. Knowing that some professing have erred concerning the faith. Never trust in yourself, Timothy. Never trust in your own ability, but trust in your God. And therefore, grace be with thee. Amen. The Lord bless his word to our souls. We'll sing from Psalm 1. Psalm 1. That man hath perfect blessedness who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinners' way, nor sitteth in the scorner's chair, but placeth his delight upon God's law and meditates on his law day and night. Psalm 1. That man hath Perfect blessedness. That man hath perfect blessedness who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men nor stands in sinners' way, nor sitteth in the scorner's chair, but placeth his delight upon God's law and meditates on his law day and night. He shall be like a tree that grows near planted by a river, which in his season yields his fruit, and his leaf fadeth never, and all he doth shall prosper well, the wicked are not so, but like they are unto the chaff, which wind drives to and fro. In judgment therefore shall not stand such as ungodly are. Nor in the assembly of the just shall wicked men appear. For why the way of godly men unto the Lord is known. Where
whereas the way of wicked men shall quite be overthrown. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord, as we've considered some very practical scriptures in this uh, chapter this evening, O oh Lord, we pray that we would not be slaves of our own sinful hearts, but Lord, that we would be made free by the grace of God in such a way that we would live like Christ, that we would think like Him, that we would desire the things that He desires that we would have the mindset, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that we would be delivered from this world, not just from the consequences of our sin, but from the very power of sin in this life. So that every secret sin would be confessed and rejected and renounced and hated in our souls. That we would hate even the first risings of sin in our hearts. And that we would quickly repent even at the first motion of sinful desires. That we would not wait for that sin to have a hold on us. That we would refuse it. We would say no to sin. That we would refuse sin. And that we would choose to love God and to hate iniquity. O Lord, grant to us this heart of Christ, this mind of Christ, by the power of thy blessed Holy Spirit. Make us, O God, as holy in this world as it is possible for a sinner to be. Make thy people to be like Christ. Grant us a double portion. Raise thy church in these days so that we would be those who would be truly called the people of God. Men and women who fear God and who hate sin and who live for thy glory. O oh, enable us, strengthen us, make us willing in the day of thy power, and bless thy people. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen.